would you like to start us with a prayer and then we'll we'll get going yes in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost amen amen O heavenly king consoler the spirit of truth presence in all places filling all things the treasury of blessings and the giver of life come and dwell in us and cleanse us of all stain and save our souls a good one in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost amen amen um, so tonight uh, I'm here with uh, David Clayton, and we're doing we're reviewing his book or going through his book, The Way of Beauty: Literature, Education, and Inspiration for Family, School, and College. So, um, as I was just mentioning, uh, David, when I read this, I, as I said, I didn't get all the way through it yet, but as I was reading it, I thought, this has got so much information in it. It's really, it's it's wonderful, you know, for especially for people like me who are not artists. It's like it gives us a lot of information, you know, so it's great. Good. Mm -hmm. So did you write this for a class or? Um, well, the story of this book is that um it's well the information uh mm -hmm. i gleaned uh over a long period of time so i uh decided i wanted to be an artist mm -hmm. uh, around the time that i was converting so in my late 20s i'm 61 now so a long mm -hmm. time ago and um when I converted, I decided that I wanted to learn about Catholic traditions in art and to uh, actually train as an artist. And I couldn't find anywhere to train. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in London at the time, um, and uh, there were a number of things. It was it wasn't just the the, the need for the skills that was hard enough. Eventually, mm -hmm. I found ways of getting. The, the artistic skill, n n not within a conventional art school, I have to add. Um, but it was also just an understanding of the basis of Catholic traditions in art. So I remember seeing um, the unveiling of a crucifixion in a Catholic church, which was in a, which was in a, a, a modernist style, so highly distorted, I thought very ugly, sort of picasso esque maybe sort of expressionistic um and but to to my mind it seemed um ugly and inappropriate and i wondered whether it was just a matter of taste maybe that's okay for some people but it's not okay for others and i'm just gonna have to um effectively put up with it and so I started to look at the basis for Catholic traditions in art. Um, and that led to a lot of research, a lot of uh, a look at history. And my discovery was, well, there are no definitive rules. There's no canon law on the styles of art, for example. There's more on music, uh, more, more written by popes, for example, on specific styles of music so you have Pius the 10th saying that Gregorian chant and polyphony are the are the styles and actually issuing a a motu proprio I think at the turn of the last century around that period well there isn't the equivalent in art there are lots of statements saying the art should be appropriate for the liturgy it should be beautiful it should it should uh, be worthy of veneration but very little on what that means in terms of style so um why does iconographic art look one way why does gothic art look another why does baroque art look yet different and mm -hmm. modern art different to all three of those is mm -hmm. it just the times have moved on and it's a preference well that, what i discovered is that no that while there are no rules there are traditions um and largely the modern styles ignore traditions and the principles that underlie the traditions of all sacred art um, mm -hmm. as practiced up to about the point up to about the 19th century or something and it's in the 19th century that it started to disintegrate there were still some streams of good art um, mm -hmm. 
And then in the 20th century, it just about all disappeared, I would mm. say, in the Roman Catholic world. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I wanted to do was write a book describing uh, what I'd learned. Uh, now, the reason for that was that uh, I effectively uh, learned all of this and, and applied it to my own training. I uh, I realized there was no school that taught what I wanted to learn, so I did my best to absorb it myself. Um, mm -hmm. I went to different people who had different areas of expertise in terms of skill or knowledge and pulled mm -hmm. it all together mm -hmm. um, and eventually got a... a, a job as artist in residence at Thomas More College of Liberal Arts mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. So that's mm -hmm. what brought me over from England to the US. And so I I had I had this training, I had this understanding. And it was I I offered to teach at Thomas More in addition to uh, painting uh, I offered to teach a course called The Way of Beauty, which mm -hmm. uh, was offered to all freshmen, um, outlining these principles. Mm -hmm. And included in this uh, was an investigation into the method in which artists were trained traditionally. So um, I outlined this in the book. And there are certain key features that are present in every traditional artistic training, which are absent. I think in every every principle is absent in the arts, the training you get in art schools today. Um, but I uh, wanted to. I described this, and then what I wanted to do was. Uh, it occurred to me that if I was correct in my research and what I described was was right, then. Here we have a training which forms the individual um, to be open to inspiration and to have the inclination to follow it if God should choose to give it. And this this was the assumption of um, a traditional artistic training. There were the certain things that were built into us into it that mm -hmm. were designed to incline incline us to be creative, to follow inspiration to participate in the creative work of God through the practical virtue of art. Mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that if this was the case, this was appropriate not just for artists, but for all people. It, this should be part of a, a, a Catholic education, a general Catholic education. Mm -hmm. And so I started to read uh, the, all the papal encyclicals that I could find on education and the Catholic Church documents on education, because I wanted to see what the, the arguments were as to what a Catholic education ought to be, and mm -hmm. then so that I could, if, if it was, if there was, it matched, shall we say, I could make an argument that the, this formation should be included in it. And what I found is that the Church's documents actually. Uh, described what I was, what I'd done. So, in short, what the the, the formation um, offers that that artists were offered is a liturgically oriented formation, which is a, a large part of this is a mystagogical catechesis. In other words, a formation which enables us to to deepen our participation in the worship of God, so that we. Um, partake of the divine nature. We, we are supernaturally transformed. Mm -hmm. And it was Pius XI, particularly, who wrote an encyclical in about 1927. I forget the name of it. Um, and But he said that the end of Catholic education is to, the phrase he uses, to form the supernatural man. In other words, to make us all... Uh, transformed supernaturally mm -hmm. and then he says this enables us to uh, carry out all mundane activities it elevates them so, so that it orders them to the work of, to the work of God and so this is not just a, a book about art and those artistic traditions it's a book about artist training and then it's an argument 
uh, uh, that is aimed at trying to get people in Catholic education to adopt uh, um, a formation in creativity uh, because it has value for every single person. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I'm still trying to persuade schools to do this, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I'm ready to give it a go. But that, that's what the book is about. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's um, very different from what I think people would expect when they see it's an art book. This is, this is really um, helping to, uh, helping to form people to be able to understand art and to, to use it in a different way. That's wonderful. You know, I mean, it's, someone like me will look at an art book and see the art and, and <laughs> try to understand it. But, um, but here, I mean, this is something that could change people's lives. Well, it is. And, and it goes with, uh, for example, the, the, the other books that I've written. I, I see these <laughs> as interconnecting, all of them, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so the vision for you, which we discussed, first of all, is a, mm -hmm. a personal spirituality if you like a set of spiritual exercises mm -hmm. which are to for this end mm -hmm. uh, the uh the way of beauty is uh about an educational program how you can institute this at the level of, of education in schools and colleges um and the little oratory is about um having a family faith uh, the domestic church that um, again, uh, suggests that families do certain things together and um, homes, but mm -hmm. again, the end in mind is exactly the same. It's the supernatural mm -hmm. transformation of man so mm -hmm. that we may get to heaven and have a joyful life here on earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There does seem to be a lack of joy. <laughs> you know? It yes. just is me. A lot of people are just stressed out and uh, running around like, well, here we have the expression like chickens with their heads cut off. Yeah. You know, uh, they don't have joy. They don't have a plan for life or what they want to do. You know, it's um, it's interesting how things have changed, you know, mm. for the worst. <laughs> <laughs> That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, anyway, so that's... Uh, it's interesting because, I mean, you know, people can get all four books and, uh, you know, you can have a real impact on someone's life or a family's life. That's great. Well, I'd hope so, yes. Um, so I don't know what – would you like me to focus on certain parts of the book or what, what caught your eye, Cynthia, as you were um, reading through it? Mm -hmm. Let me just get to the index here, the contents. Um, I thought uh, this idea of what does such a culture look like, how the forms of culture reflect the patterns of the liturgy, ordering time and space numerically. That's, that's, uh, that part is very interesting because, you know, um, the majority of people would not uh, understand this on their own. They'd have to have it explained, not not saying about how you wrote it. Uh, certainly, that's understandable. But, you know, they'd never come across this on their own, I don't think. No, and I, um, yeah, there's a story. So this idea of number being um, an ordering principle in beauty, mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not unknown through Christianity. So Bonaventure, for example, would talk about this at length. And mm -hmm. he was... Uh, a Franciscan, and Benedict the Sixteenth more recently picks up on this and talks about it in the spirit of the the liturgy. Um, mm -hmm. But it has its roots in Pythagoras and the pre-Christian Greeks. Mm -hmm. um, and but the the idea is that um, the the rhythms and patterns of the the motions of the cosmos. Um, so the, the, the planets can be seen with the naked eye, so there are traditionally seven of them, and they're distinguished from the stars because they move independently in the sky. That's 
you know, they're, every, they're just looking at dots of light. Most of the sky moves as a solid canopy. Certain mm-hmm. ones seem to move independently. Mm-hmm. So the ancient Greeks thought that's because they're got, you know, they it's a sign of gods and they have a, their own will and they move. Uh, whereas for Christians, all of this became a sign of the uh, of God. Really, they pointed to a divinity beyond, mm-hmm. and they analysed mathematically the the motions of the of the planets, and then they found parallels with the numerical analysis and that of uh, musical harmony and musical mm-hmm. scales. It's not an accident that there are seven notes in the musical scale. There were seven planets seen in the sky. Uh, they deliberately connected these things, and then the uh, they believe that the underlying new number, the dis- numerical description, was connected to its beauty. And th- th- I think the, the, what proved it for them in their minds was that when you did this in music, in sound, it sounded beautiful. So, um, and this is the amazing thing, is that, for example, when you listen to an octave, uh, and two notes which are an octave apart, everybody, every human person hears the similarity between middle C and the note C, eight notes up the scale. And, you know, if you're working on a piano, you just go up the white notes with your finger and just bump them out, and they can hear do, 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 do. They hear that octave. It's a higher in pitch, but it's similar. Now, there is nothing in the mathematics that um, says that we should hear it that way. Mm-hmm. What happens is people notice that it's there is a consensus that there is this uh, connection. Um, they're consonant, as the phrase is, they sound well together. Um, mm-hmm. And then once they spot that, they then look at the mathematics of it, and you find that the wavelengths... Uh, the ratio is one over two, or the frequencies, it's two over one, Um, or if you're using organ pipes, one is twice the length of the other, and you have this ratio of one to two. And then if you take that ratio of one to two and put it into a building, so you build a building on numerical principles, uh, the proof of whether it's beautiful or not is, is really just consensus. Do a lot of people over a long period of time look at it and find it beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, the, and I, I would say that the, the argument today is that everyone seems to think that beauty is uh, uh, simply in the eye of the beholder. It is partially. We mm-hmm. have differing tastes, but uh, there are many things that we see the same. And on the whole, If you were to travel to Oxford or to Florence, two cities which I've lived in uh, in my past, uh, very beautiful cities, Um, the tourists, and there are about 10 million a year in each city, um, travel to the old buildings in the centre that are built on these principles. They don't go to the new buildings where they uh, chose to disregard them. Um, And so people spend money and vote with their feet, I would say. Mm -hmm. Uh, And on the whole, over any period of time, it is these are the principles that seem to be appreciated as beautiful. And this is what tradition is. It looks at what people over a long period of time have appreciated. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the connection with the liturgy? Well, the liturgy follows in its seasons and its feasts Mm-hmm. the movements and the patterns of the planets. So Easter is calculated according to the phases of the moon. We, mm-hmm. we have a lunar solar calendar that, that effectively is linked to the motion of the earth around the sun and the moon around the earth. Mm-hmm. And um, there are other uh, parts of the calendar, again, that are linked to that. And then it's divided up into these musical components as well. So you have octaves for a feast. The mm-hmm. week is seven days, and then in the ch- in we go from Sunday to Sunday. So it's like going from C to middle C to a higher C. We mm-hmm. go from 
we go seven days and then the eighth is day which is sunday is simultaneously the last day of the previous week and the first of the next mm. and these octaves are natural commemorations natural passage of time passages of time cycles of time that uh engender harmonious living we are made to appreciate the beauty of the cosmos to live our lives in a pattern which fits to it and to worship god in that pattern and mm -hmm. the music that we play in that church should conform to that pattern of music as well and that's what polyphony and chant does and the art that you have in the church should be embedded with the proportions and the the um what you would call the the compositional elements which again um are structured according to these principles of beauty and in the past artists would have known this they would have known why they were doing it and they would have connected it directly to the beauty of the cosmos um now that goes all the way back to the ancient greeks it's the christians who then say all of this beauty points to a single creator who is god um the god of the father the son and the holy spirit mm -hmm. yeah so that's uh that's a good explanation of all of that it's like wow <laughs> that's exciting um so um i guess also as we um as we look through here um you do mention um forms of figurative christian liturgical art and guiding uh the artists uh and those establishing a canon of Im images for study and an education of beauty beauty so um I have to, I, I was reading through and uh, things were clear until uh, number 12, Artis, uh, Aristotle, Aquinas, and St. Francis, how the new naturalism of Gothic art developed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, we'll go through a brief <laughs> 2,000 years of art history in two minutes. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, what's happened is that... Um, you have uh first of all christianity largely underground but you know the early church so okay. and where where there was art we have very little because of course art is a visual proof that you're a christian if you paint cross mm -hmm. cross so people were reluctant to do that they tended to use uh you know a fish as a secret sign for christ for example uh for that reason mm -hmm. um but what happened is once uh, the church started to develop an artistic style, which it did st steadily, and especially once um, people could openly be Christian, and so after about three, I think three twenty eight uh, AD, something like that in the Roman Empire, um, then you start to get a, a much more occurrence of art, of the production of art, and. Initially, they draw on the styles of Roman uh, and ancient Greek art, so the classical forms in their figurative art. So you, it's, you can't really distinguish a, a pagan painting from a Christian in terms of the style. But actually, very quickly, within 100 years, a, a distinctive Christian style developed. So by about 420, you start to see um, mosaics, which are distinct from the earlier Roman pagan style. And mm -hmm. that is what we call today the iconographic style. Icons are still really consistent with that style that was established. And that became standard across all of Christendom. So whether you're in Coptic Egypt or Celtic Britain, um, there are local variations, but stylistically, the underlying principles are the same. Mm -hmm. um, and there have been interruptions. I, I can talk about this, but that's still the style that is used in Byzantine and Orthodox churches today. Mm -hmm. um, in the West, in the Roman church, um, you start to get a change occurring and the development of a new style which developed from 
the iconographic forms, the latest of which um, was the Romanesque style from about 11, 1200, um, which actually a lot of that style came from contact with Greece. It's the, the Greek style iconography came into the West uh, because of the Crusades and uh, the reconquest of uh, previously, you know, long held Byzantine lands in southern Italy, for example. Um, and so you have this Romanesque style, which is the last Western variant of the iconographic style. And then the change occurs. You start to get an increase in naturalism. So what I mean by that is that there's a greater correspondence to natural appearances. So anyone who looks at an icon will see that it's very stylized, it's partially abstracted. If it's a man, you know it's a man because he has two arms and two legs and a head, and it's recognizable, but there's a very obvious style. Well, now what started to happen around 1200 and beyond is greater observation of nature and more naturalistic poses. Um, and this continued steadily for the, uh, well, actually, I, I would say right through to the present day that we're used to highly naturalistic art today. And that began with the Gothic. It's not the High Renaissance, as many people think, it's the Gothic. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, it was still stylized to our modern eye. But nevertheless, there's a transition. Now, what do Aristotle and St. Francis and uh, Aquinas have to do with that? Well, it has been argued, my mentor, Stratford Caldicott, used to argue this, and so this is where I got this argument from, um, that the, one of the changes occurred with the rediscovery of the works of Aristotle, um, again through the Crusades, I think people were finding his works in libraries, and then also, I believe, the fall of... Toledo in the Reconquista, that the Christians moving south into Spain and pushing back the Arab uh, occupiers. Toledo, uh, which is south of Madrid, fell, and there was a large library that contained, even though these were uh, Islamic people, uh, a lot of ancient Greek manuscripts, and they rediscovered the works of Aristotle. And so Christians grabbed this with glee, started to translate it, and mm -hmm. figures, the scholastics, and uh, figures such as Albert the Great and Aristotle started to incorporate Arist Aristotelian ideas into Christian thinking. So always the measure of truth is the gospel, uh, but they were, they were extremely open. I mean, they believed that uh, natural reason which is what Aristotle was using, could go a long way to ascertaining truth. And so mm -hmm. they were open to examining it and uh, testing it. And certain things came from Aristotle, which uh, reflected a change in emphasis. It wasn't a total change in outlook or anything like that. But as a result of Aristotle, there was a greater emphasis on the validity of information gained by the senses and uh, the a strong more strongly held belief shall we say or sense in the re reliability of the truth that the senses could look at the world around us what was around us was real and mm -hmm. that the senses were were getting genuine information now mm -hmm. of course we're subject to the fall so there's a there is a certain distortion there, uh, sure. and our senses are not perfect, but uh, and the world itself is forward, so it's not as it really ought to be, but nevertheless, there is enough good information there for us to actually start to uh, ascertain things about creation, and from that, therefore, the creator, the creator, creation is the sign of the creator. So this this um, created an intellectual curiosity in the world around us and the beginnings of the scientific method, natural science. Albert the Great, who was St. Thomas's teacher, was a known natural scientist. Uh, and the beginnings of the, of the great power of natural science 
that we have today really they were given impetus by these figures mm -hmm. so that's one thing the second thing is that these ideas were transmitted into the popular mindset strat argued through the spirituality of saint francis of assisi um so saint francis well, he himself was a sort of anti-intellectual in a way, um, but he loved uh, nature, and he had a positive Christian view of it as a as something that came from God. So he placed it properly in the hierarchy of being. He didn't worship it as the pagans do or modern radical eco warriors do. They're just modern versions of. Uh, pagans who worship nature francis wasn't like that at all even though he's often cited as a saint and for sort of ecology he understood that man was higher in the was was the the, the jewel of creation if you like mm -hmm. see and that god is above man um but as long as we do that we can appreciate the goodness and the beauty of nature and uh, saint francis did this and this positive attitude to uh to the world around us uh, mm -hmm. was transmitted into the culture very powerfully as a result of this mm -hmm. the, the with regard to art art is a reflection of the culture the styles of art so it reflects both the popular mindset and the mindset of intellectuals in universities all of these contribute to it contribute to it um, but the, the result in art was that artists, just as the scientists started to look at the creation and examine it as in the, uh, mathematically, as a natural scientist would, uh, mm -hmm. the artists started to look at it um, and uh, seek to imitate its beauty and its structure in their art. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where you get the rise in naturalism. And just to give you examples of the sort of artists, so uh, the the height of this, people classify things differently, but they're often called the artists of the Northern Renaissance. Although it isn't, um, it's certainly not the the Renaissance. They they more akin to Gothic, but artists such as Jan van Eyck, for example, or Roger van der Weyden. Uh, have a gothic style to them it's an extension of the, of the same movement but they're highly naturalistic that in um jan van eyck's famous painting of the mystical lamb there are all these plants around it is in a beautiful setting and i think they've observed some i don't know what to, i'm going to say 50 different botanical varieties that can be identified in the painting mm -hmm. So an extraordinary mm -hmm. level of observation of nature. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I should mention, because a lot of people, when they think of naturalism in art, tend to think of the high Renaissance. So then immediately they think of Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Raphael. And mm -hmm. this was all about observation of nature and naturalism. Well... Mm -hmm. They did observe nature, but in doing this, they were just really continuing the process that had begun with the Gothic artists. Mm -hmm. um, what did change in the High Renaissance was that they started to change the way that they trained. And in an artistic training, there are two core disciplines when you exercise your skills. One mm -hmm. is the observation of nature. Mm -hmm. The High Renaissance did that just as the Gothic artists did. The other is that you copy a canon, you imitate a canon of old masters, and that's how you the style is transmitted. So just to explain, if I wanted to paint um, superheroes in the style of Superman and Spider-Man, the training that would give me that ability, so I would naturally draw and paint that way would be to observe lots of muscle bound men and women uh, in nature but then also to copy as many marvel comics as i could and so i would do both 
What happened in the High Renaissance is that they started to copy the uh, Greek and Roman statues as part of their training. And so the change in style that you see emanated from the change in the canon of old masters that they copied. Mm -hmm. um, but, but they were highly naturalistic and they developed new uh, techniques of naturalism, such as single point perspective, for example. But that wasn't something that the Gothic artist would have rejected had they known they had um, r rather cruder forms of perspective that they used. Um, but all of that is part of this movement, the, the, the naturalism in itself, that began really with, th that's your first question, Aristotle, Aquinas, and Francis. The, mm -hmm. the great change in the High Renaissance is the observation of these Greek and Roman statues. That's where you get a sl sudden jump in style, and they start to look like um, Greek statues from about 500 BC. Mm -hmm. um, some stat carvings of Michelangelo look like they were painted, you know, before Plato lived, for example, in the style that he uses. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's, uh, that's interesting things to find out. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I talk to you, I learn a lot. <laughs> I appreciate it. But, um, yeah, that's, um, that's all very interesting. You know, to see how things like this developed and, in a sense, different cultures coming together through their religion. It's interesting. Yes, and the, the I would say that the modern, I mean, they never really worried about it in the past. They weren't analyzing culture in mm -hmm. Gothic time because they were just living it and they just did it, you know. They, they, we, people are, the reason that there are so many people who are analyzing culture today is because everyone's very dissatisfied with it and they want to know how to improve it and how they can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But sort of modern, more recent commentators, so a lot of people would quote Christopher Dawson, for example, mm -hmm. an Eng Englishman, who a historian who lived in the last century, but John Paul II said this and Benedict said this. They say that what forms um, most are the, the cultural forms is our attitude to God. And mm -hmm. uh, for Christ, a Christian culture, it's the forms that we encounter in the liturgy that impress their pattern up, upon our souls mm -hmm. most profoundly, and we take them out into the, into the world uh, for good or ill. You know, if we, if we, if we've got ugliness in our churches, we will take ugliness out into the world. Mm -hmm. This is why it matters. This is what this matters Profoundly, I would say. Yeah. But is, it, is ugliness distracting us from the, our encounter with God in the liturgy? It's then mm. secondarily, I mean, that's a, the most important reason to worry about it, but yeah. it, it secondarily um, distorts our capacity to contribute beautifully and gracefully to the culture once we go out into the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that makes a lot of sense. I um I have seen some art that even I thought was um I wouldn't say inappropriate but not not um attractive enough for the subject matter you know yeah. so um you know when it was something to do with religion or spirituality and I thought you know that that could have been done better like I really know. <laughs> Well, yeah. It, the the thing is, it's it's difficult to say definitively. As I say, um, the the styles. Of, so I, I should go back and say that Benedict the Sixteenth. So he's an authority that I would trust. His mm -hmm. taste seems to coincide with mine, so I trust him even more. He's <laughs> convenient for me to cite, shall we say, for that reason. But I mean, he's he's. Is someone who generally I admire greatly. Now, he says that there are three authentic liturgical traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the iconographic, which I mentioned, the Gothic. Mm -hmm. He says not the High Renaissance. He says that is distracting uh, from the liturgy. So not Michelangelo, not Raphael, 
not Leonardo. They're not the style to go for, he says. Um, and he's someone who sat in the Sistine Chapel with all those Michelangelo's looking down on him. But the Baroque, the art of the 17th century, artists such as Velazquez uh, or Georges de la Tour or Ribera or Rembrandt even, mm -hmm. um, he says that is authentic, an authentically liturgical style, that the Baroque effectively redirected the high Renaissance and imbued it with a, more, a, a greater spiritual quality. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, the, the question is then, what art do you put in churches today? Um, because it isn't as simple, the, the, you know, what you like might not be what I like, mm -hmm. and some people will like the, what I think is the ugly modern stuff. So how do you decide? And so I would say at this point, we should go with tradition. Now, the, those traditions, what Benedict is pointing to, is traditions within the church, which it, the church in her wisdom has, shall we say, assessed to, be co to contribute positively to the worship of the faithful. Right. Now, the question then is, how do they gauge such a thing? How is Benedict gauging such a thing? I mean, he might have very well-developed instincts, but what people are looking at, it's something that you gauge over centuries and over generations incrementally. And it, it's not about whether people respond emotionally positive, positively to the art. Mm -hmm. they do, but they may not. It's about whether, as a result of worshipping with that art, the faithful go out and live a better Christian life. Yeah. Does it seem to, when mm -hmm. combined with the worship, um, lead people to Christian lives, to, to contributing beautifully to the culture, to loving their neighbor as themselves, and loving God most and worshipping well? And mm -hmm. so these styles have been developed and found to have that impact. We've mm -hmm. dislocated from traditions at this stage, and modern art comes out of a totally different idea. It has no Christian roots whatsoever. It's, it's more akin to Marxist ideology, actually, which is anti-Christian, the mm -hmm. form of modern art. So what do we do? I would say we go back to those three traditions, and as an mm -hmm. artist, you can choose which, and start to produce work in that style. But... Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, very carefully and very conservatively and cautiously, we adapt mm -hmm. it just to see how it connects with modern people. Right. Uh, this is a, a, a cautious, slow process. When in doubt, go with the past. But the even the best art of the 17th century or the best Gothic, mm -hmm. we can't simply imitate it because that – that the underlying principles, the universal principles, will speak to us today, but very often the particulars through which they're expressed will be different. Now, we've yeah. got to start somewhere. So I'd say let's start there, but we must be open to a, a, a gradual change. Mm -hmm. I stress gradual. This, the, the, the transition from the Romanesque to the Gothic occurred over generations. It was yeah. slow and gentle. And that's mm -hmm. what we should do today, be patient. And mm -hmm. really, at this point, just to repeat what we did in the past will be good enough because it, it's, it's a lot better than what we have in the past. But that is not the ultimate goal. Now, in order to make those changes, we have to understand deeply what the, the, the underlying principles of liturgical art are. We mm -hmm. must understand how people engage with it in their worship. We must mm -hmm. be aware of what Catholic culture is. We must be well-formed to worship well in our mystagogical catechesis. Artists especially must be well-formed because I don't see how artists who aren't habitually using art in their worship can have any sense of what nourishes good worship. They must be used to doing this. Mm -hmm. So this is a... Now, in the past, the culture did so much of this. We, you know, we, uh, we people just absorbed the, the, the air that they breathed, if you like, um, mm -hmm. and it directed them 
to 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 continue to paint as those around them did. Today mm -hmm. we have to be much more direct. Um, mm -hmm. Again, you can see why my efforts to establish a culture of faith through things like the Little Oratory are there. Mm -hmm. Why I'm interested in developing an educational mm -hmm. method which will do this, a personal mm -hmm. spirituality that will mm -hmm. assist us, because um, those sort of things could have just been taken for granted in the past, but not today. We we need consciously, I think, to incorporate these things into our lives to lead mm -hmm. a Christian life. So it happens to us, I was going to say naturally, but probably the word gracefully is better. You know, yeah. we, uh, supernaturally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really. yeah. But uh, gracefully does that, you know, these are things that can't be rushed. And uh, I think, you know, over time, things will change for the positive. And, uh, you know, we can all work towards it, but... Yes. You know. It's interesting. I, <laughs> I am optimistic. I'm naturally optimistic, and my faith just reinforces that. Um, mm -hmm. I was giving a talk a week ago, and someone said... Because I painted a picture of how bad it is, and it's terrible today. And I think I've said this to you both of <laughs> previous interviews, that there's so much that is wrong with the institutional church, the liturgy is a disaster for the most part, with a few beacons of light here and there. But that doesn't mm -hmm. stop each of us as Catholics freely choosing the sort of things that can lead to sanctity and a joyful yeah. life. And mm -hmm. those who happen to be artists as well will contribute beautifully. And I think enough people are realizing this. I think that while the Overall, the church is shrinking. The core, which is faithful and living a Christian life, is growing at this point. And that includes in the seminaries. It's the young seminarians who are orthodox, who are interested in this sort of thing. So mm -hmm. as Christians, we know that there's always hope for the future. But I actually believe it now, actually. Uh, beyond mm -hmm. that, shall we say, be, shall we say beyond just knowing as an abstraction, I ought to, it, ought, it must be true. Uh, mm -hmm. I see the signs around me that reinforce this, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I know a lot of very, very faithful people compared to, you know, I mean, when I first converted, of course, there were faithful people, but it, it didn't strike me that they were, um, that it was part of their core all the time. Yeah. And that feeling, you know, that, I mean, you, I know you can't be base things on feelings, but, you know, I've just found so many people that I think, you know, they're, they're living a Catholic life from the minute they get up in the morning until the minute they fall asleep at night, you know, or trying to do the very best they can and looking for the best. So I do think things are changing. Yes. But, mm -hmm. I do too. Yeah. Uh, I just read a wonderful book, or I'm reading it, it's upstairs, on the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, you, I'll, I'll recommend it to you. I'll give you the title. Um, but in this, Jared, uh, I forget his surname, he, he talks about how, in the end, it's the Eucharist which you know, and, and our approach to it, which will mm -hmm. transform us and change the culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, yeah. And his focus is on uh, trying to reawaken our sense of the real presence of Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, we have to do the, all of these things <laughs> at all levels. You know, we, yeah. we, we mm -hmm. need a formation going in. But this is the goal. It's really about deification in the liturgy Mm -hmm. an, an authentic encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And from that, the more that we uh, encourage that and le people are led into it, mm -hmm. uh, then th the more that we will see changes around us. And no one will be able to stop that when it happens, I don't think. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I had worked at um, Holy Apostles for many, many years, 
And I can tell, you know, that over time, we had so many wonderful lay students come. You know, and I mean, obviously, you had seminarians and, and sisters and, and brothers. But it was the lay people, you know, that, that wanted to learn so much, you know, that, and it wasn't their vocation to be a priest or to be a nun. And uh, yet they were coming uh, to learn and of course online to learn and uh, that really impressed me it's like there's there is a movement I think among among Catholics who are seeing that things weren't going well for a while and now we need to stop that and move forward yeah yeah so yeah the, the other thing is that um, this is something that I don't talk about in this book directly, but the principles that this describes, it, it's true about them. And this has dawned on me recently, is that the the need for a, an authentic creativity in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so we, if we must discern our personal vocation, we need to find what God is directing us to. But mm -hmm. we really are called to contribute to raising the world up. Yeah. And... and Forming matter around us beautifully, which we do in all sorts of ways. It's not not just about art. It's about anything in which we, uh, you know, if we dig the ground to grow plants, mm -hmm. cooking, art. We mm -hmm. interact with the world around us, mm -hmm. the people around us, and that can be done creatively and mm -hmm. gracefully and beautifully. And this tr traditional artistic training uh, w would. Uh, would encourage that, would help with that, and when we do that again, it's more. It's it, it, that's that will be our joy, actually. Um, but I, I hear research scientists today, for example, saying that there is that, that there haven't been any major developments in science for seventy years or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's just been an adaptation of what went before. And that the pattern of life that we lead isn't really that different uh, mm -hmm. in many ways from what somebody would have been doing in 1905, you know, 1905. Well, let's say after the First World War, you had planes. You, you know, the, the, the main sort of look of life, the clothes, the, 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 the things that people did, hasn't really changed that much. And most of the developments is technology came before that in one way or another a lot of people might point to computers as being an exception to that but the 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 point that was being made is that a, a lot of scientists say we need creativity and what the scientists say who and i did science at university so i can relate to this is that creativity does not come through the application of reason uh, the mm -hmm. way that you make advances in science is effectively you just have an idea. It mm -hmm. just occurs. Once you have the idea, that's your hypothesis, mm -hmm. then you test it. Mm -hmm. with it. Um, and even as you're developing your hypothesis, you're looking at the data, but really you're looking at an array of data and you're con you're, the idea as to how you... Uh, actually interpret it, it's just something that pops into your head. They don't know where those ideas come from. Um, after that, you, you test it with reason, and that makes the transition then from hypothesis to theorem. Now, um, the, the way in which we actually have ideas is that we actually we complete patterns Mm -hmm. So if you have a, if I have the three points like that, and mm -hmm. uh, anyone who can't see this is just listening, I'm doing three dots that of four that would make a square. If you see the three, then automatically you look at that and you say, I know the fourth dot will go here because we know, we remember what squares look like and it looks <laughs> like something ought to go there. Yeah. Now, the more that we are... Uh, we have him imprinted on our souls, so to speak, the pattern of the beauty of the cosmos, the more we will see, we will be able to complete the pattern for mm -hmm. the underlying order. Mm -hmm. And that leads to beautiful solutions 
in anything from science to entrepreneurship to um, just you know anything we do in our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I this training, I, I'm using this really to make an argument for the inclusion of a traditional artistic training uh, or something like that. You can have the same in music and the arts. Um, mm -hmm in the education of people and not to view it as recreation or something that's a bit of relaxation before you get to the hard stuff, which is reading books and doing exams. Mm -hmm. The point is that you can learn all you like, but if you want to impart wisdom, as Christians, we have the opportunity to uh, allow people to receive or to help people to receive divine wisdom and and be guided by God's grace as they mm -hmm. creatively use all the knowledge that you give them in this, in education. Yeah. And I would say that um, people should be jumping at this, and that, and that is at least as important as the information you give them, as what they learn in the exams, mm -hmm. the process of applying it and uh also doing it uh, in an artistic way, it develops a different faculty of creative thinking and the imagination, um, which again is extremely useful to people going forward, never mind in the, the most important way, which is in contributing to the holiness of their lives and lives of virtue. But if you want to be a, have a, a good career, that this will help you dramatically if you're interested. And, of mm. course, if it's combined with the faith, all this is will be directed to the common good and is likely to create a culture and a society which is less divided and uh, more beautiful and more mm. ho harmonious in its operation. We could sure use that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's... Uh... That's an interesting approach. I think you. I think you're probably right. It's, yeah. So we'll we'll check back in in ten years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there is there is no question that uh, I don't think there's any question that that God also created us with creative urges and that sort of thing. And so you know, it's uh, it's good to see people thinking about. Um, what we can do to to help the situations in the, the church today and, um, you know, just to learn more and, uh, you know, work on it. You know, it's, it's not, I think many people in the church think, well, it's the priest's job. You know, and of course mm -hmm. it is to a great extent, but it's also the, the job of everybody else who is Catholic. You know, mm -hmm. we should contributing so yeah that's inspiring <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so um was there anything that you'd like to um add uh before we close i don't think so i well actually one little shout out the middle section Mm -hmm. the, the mathematics of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish more people would take notice, particularly architects. It, mm -hmm. it, it could, uh, it's not difficult mathematics. Um, it's pre-calculus algebra, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's at that level. You need a little bit of a, an aptitude. But you, if you're interested in designing buildings that will wow people with their beauty and participate in the beauty of Florence or the beauty of Oxford and the beauty of the cosmos, the mathematics of beauty, which I'm just repeating from uh, Boethius and the ancient Greeks and Benedict, uh, these theories, uh, I think, could uh, transform society and your career, architects, if you're listening, you take the effort. Most people don't believe I've got anything to tell them, but... Maybe some will. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so uh, would you like to close us with prayer? 
Yes, I will. God, in our thoughts and words and deeds, send your Holy Spirit to guide us that we may complete your will, grace responding to grace. May the beauty of our work inspire those who see it to love as Christ loved, that through worship of you and charity to others, all may know his peace and joy. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much for the interview, and I believe we're on again tomorrow night. We are, yep. Okay. <laughs> I'll see you then. Okay. Good night. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye.